welcome everyone. My name is Tracy Clark, and I'm part of the uh, staff. I'm also the chair of the yeah, Special Education Advisory Committee. And I welcome everyone here. Thank you for all your patience as we try to work together talk. And also, big shout out to St. George and the school who are at the school this evening. So, uh, our conversation, we have We are going to do a draw three draw with three of Hannah's books uh, at the end of the night. So uh Stephen will oh, be yeah. it. Thank you. I like apparently. You do. Well, there you go. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for making it tonight. And uh, I'll just start off with a quick uh, intro bio for Hannah tonight. First of all, Hannah is a award-winning author, educator, emotional health consultant, and a keynote speaker. She's a co-author of the best-selling book, Reclaiming Our Students, and uh, she works closely with Mary Newbo uh, Strija, because they wrote the book together. She focuses on a trauma-informed resource for teachers and parents rooted in the relationship-based approach, now being translated into multiple languages internationally, and has uh, been adopted by school boards across Canada. Hannah has been recognized through the Canadian Human Rights Commission in 2017, and she also won a 2017 Gold International New Game Children's Book Award. Hannah delivers uh, professional development across uh, the country. She's worked in the Yukon. She's worked across Canada providing school boards with valuable information on attachment as well as relationship approaches. We, uh, we have worked together uh, through the pandemic, and uh, she's presented at CSPA with Maris Richard. And we just felt it was a wonderful opportunity to have her come here to Ottawa to present to parents, but also to work with our K-1 educators, so focusing on those approaches specifically. So with great pleasure, and with uh, this further ado, I'd like to introduce Hannah. So, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just going to get mic'd up. All right. Is it working now? No? All right. It's not working. I'm just going to keep going. I don't know what else to do. I have people here. I'm going. Okay. So, um, welcome. Happy to have you here. I um, I want to look tonight as we're as we're going through this. You should not have to memorize anything when it comes to kids. Hopefully, even in an hour and a half, 
when you leave here, you'll just see things maybe a little bit differently. If you ever go to a shop and someone says, that you can memorize when you leave, you're like, oh my gosh, I really need to get it. We'll never stick it. Ever, 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 ever. And hopefully, tonight, just to see you just rest and relax, and hopefully, it can land on you and your intuition and your eyes will just like change when you leave. So, I'm going to start, I'm gonna start by asking, by asking everybody to close your eyes. So, I want you to so imagine, imagine that moment. 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 Imagine, Imagine the leaves, leaves are hanging down, down and the edges are sort of browning. It's not, not, you know, very close to the Now, just open your eyes. eyes. Open your eyes. What, what intuitively, what intuitively is the very first thing you would say, say to yourself? You're going to open your eyes. Very, very first thing. So you're going to open your eyes. What would you probably say? Exactly. Almost everybody goes to the goodness. We got to water. water. Or you, you might, might go in there over water, or maybe it's a bit cold, cold there, or a bit too hot there, or need more sun. But you would know intuitively to go to the conditions. Does that make sense in nature? You would know the plant has everything it needs inside of itself to thrive. And if the conditions were conducive, it would thrive. This is the exact same thing with children. Their behavior is like the leaves of the plant. It tells us something about their inner world. It says something working for me or something is not working for me. And if we only go to work on the behavior, I stop it, cut it out, that's enough. Or we have to always reward them or bribe them or whatever the thing is, it will never last because we didn't get to, well, why is that behavior there in the first place? If we did that with the plant, that would be like keeping the leaves green and taping it up. We only worked on the leaves, not why they were working, but we worked on what was soft. Might last for a while. Might last for a little bit, but it would never last long term. And it might be helpful. I feel like scaffolding. You know, you might hold it up for a while, and that's good. That's helpful. But, you know, we can work with the behavior as well. But if we don't look at the root causes, we're, We're on a hamster wheel with the behavior over and, and over and over, and it is absolutely exhausting for us, us not So what we're going to look at today is some of the root causes of what of, of, of behavior, as well as what's going on. Now, if we look at this question, this is an important question. If we don't understand what's going on, what is this in our culture, why do we have an epidemic of anxiety? Why do we have an epidemic of aggression? Why do we have an epidemic of what's called shut down kids? Shut down is like, whatever. I don't care. Doesn't matter. It's like, nothing matters. No eye contact. Doesn't matter to me. Stupid. No feeling. Why do we have this? What is going on? If you just come up with strategies to, to help change your child that aren't rooted in the insight of what's going on, we'll never last. So we have to understand what's going on. A lot of people will say, oh, it's because of um, COVID. Mm, no. We wrote our book for COVID. Our tagline is, my children were anxious, aggressive, and shut down the never what we can do about it. We didn't know COVID was coming. Our book was released in the middle of COVID. COVID might have been a magnifying glass for an issue that was already there, but it was already there. Why? What happened? So let's look at two sort of key factors that have shifted in our culture. That have wreaked havoc on childhood. Wreaked havoc, havoc on, on emotion, emotion and emotion that drive behavior. So, um, this is not, by the way, blame on any family. This is a culture shift. This is a Western culture shift that has happened. So, let's look at a few key factors that have changed. One is that we are living in a culture of disconnection. What happens is cultures create rituals over time, we create rituals that take care of both the individual person as well as the collective community. And these rituals are there so that families don't have to think about them. You don't have to think about something when it's a ritual. So if you shower or brush your teeth, you don't think about it, it's just the norm. You just do it, you don't have to think about it. Just, you just know it's what you do. One of those rituals is eating together as a family, okay? In, In the United, United States, States, just under 8% of families eat together on a regular basis. We don't have the Canadian stats, we believe the kind of close. 
Okay. Now you might think really compared to the coffee we deal eat together. It actually kind of is for a couple reasons. One is that mammals are going to stay connected and eat together. Almost all mammals. That, that not all most mammals eat together that wouldn't be connected. And so when you and your family first started dating, when you're rope when you're in the beginnings of romance, I bet you would have first seen you didn't eat with your own partner. Without, without even knowing why. why. Without even knowing why, why. But, but 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 because, because it builds build attachment. attachment. When, when people, people eat together, together there's a conscious attachment building. building. So that's so that's the reason. the reason. Children also had this anchor that kept them connected to their adults. At least once a day, they sat together. They might have not at first had eye contact. They might have been grumpy. They might not have felt like coming to the table. But eventually, eye contact was made. Debates were had, and this was an anchor. If you take away a, a cultural norm, now it falls on individual families to have to think of it. Oh, do you feel like eating? I don't know. Like just eating the car as you're going through programs. All of a sudden, it's it's it, it's no longer a ritual. Also, is the day of is a light in your eyes too? You're good. Come on closer. This is nice. Come on closer. Anyone can feel free to come on closer. <laughs> um, also, we have lost the ritual of a day of rest. Almost every culture has had a day of rest since the dawn of time. Some it was Fridays, some it was Saturdays, and some it was Sundays. But this was a day where people either gathered at mosque or synagogue or church or temple. They gathered with their people to sing, to come together in community. They might have had big dinners together where they invited aunties and uncles and grandparents. They came together. This was a day when stores were closed and our systems could just come down to rest. Before we had stores, markets were closed. It was a day of nothing. We no longer have a day of rest. Some people adhere to that, but not many. Some people will go to church, but we still have to check our phones. We still are busy. We still shop. We still, still do all sorts of things. It is no longer a day where your system can come down and you gather with your people. So let's just park that over there. Okay, let's park the culture of disconnection over there. Now let's look at something else that happened about 30 years ago that had absolutely massive consequences on childhood. It changed it. This is the first generation of children who've lived in this experimental age. We replaced play with entertainment. Our culture replaced play with entertainment. This change is absolutely massive. Entertainment is the in-breath for children. It's the, and play is the out-breath. It's the, and we have children who are breathing in, and in, and in, and in, and in, and in, and they are literally not coping. Literally, not coping. What happened was our culture removed something that was 100% crucial to healthy child development. And this, is, um, this isn't something that's kind of sort of maybe important. It's something that was absolutely essential to healthy child development. What they removed was what we call void moments. Void moments are like these empty, empty, gentle times of nothing. Or nothing. Like the time a child sits in a car and looks out the window. Maybe they count telephone poles. The time the child lie on a trampoline and just watch the clouds or sits in a grocery cart and plays with their fingers on the, the handle or sits in a restaurant waiting for the food and doodles on the placemat. The times where a child had, there's nothing, it's just boredom. It's empty times of nothing. The inventions of devices that travel with children removed void moments for the vast majority of children. Many children are now entertained in cars. They're entertained in grocery stores. They're entertained while they're waiting in doctor's offices and restaurants. They're, not only did they have their void moments removed, on top of that, they're being filled with stimulus over and over. This does not bode well for childhood nor adolescence. Children who have this, it's like in the teen years, oh my goodness, we will see even other changes happen because they have void moments are essential to development. A couple of reasons in childhood, void moments are where play takes root. Play takes root in boredom. Without boredom, children won't move into free play. With, and play takes care of emotion, and emotion drives behavior. You take play out of a culture, and oh my goodness, watch the behavior shift. Play, you might right now be thinking about play like, I don't know, little kids and toys. 
Play is so much more than that. Play is an out-breath. It's anything that comes from inside to out. When we look at culture and we see that children all around the world are playing the same games or playing with the same themes, we know something really big is happening with the psychology of kids, but also how play is taking care of that child's psychology. One of the ways we know this is by the study of children's literature, children's books. Children's books fall into the category of play because they enliven the child's imagination, the child's thinking of things that often comes out in their play afterwards. So there's one theme in children's books that is the most common theme in the entire world, not just in Western culture. The same exact theme is the most common theme in every single culture in the world. Which, so this is telling us something pretty big because it's in every single culture. So children are driven in droves to read books which weave this theme into them. Round age five or six, sometimes four, but are we usually around four, five, six, children start to be drawn to this theme and it goes all the way till around age 13 to 15, the vast the interest. So think for a moment of chapter books, not little tiny skinny books, but chapter books, books that get into the meat of, of a story. If anyone wants to guess this common theme that is the most popular theme in the whole world, in every single culture, go for it. You can guess. Don't worry if you get it wrong. It's not a wrong about you. Whatever. Think back to your childhoods. Yes. So sports are really popular. Magic is really popular. Think of books. Think of this theme would even be in sports books and even in magic books. This theme overweaves in many genres. There's a hero. There's a challenge. Absolutely. Yes. Something very specific. It's a very specific challenge that happens. Very specific challenge. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> Being orphaned. It is the most common theme in the world is being orphaned. If you can't hear me, just move closer because, and, and I'll explain why, because I don't have a microphone, so it'll be too hard to project. So if you can't hear me, just come closer. So Harry Potter, Anne of Green Gables, Secret Garden, Bambi, Lion King, every Disney story, almost every folk story, almost every superhero story, um, Boxcar Children, Annie, Pippi Longstockings, Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe, Cinderella, almost every story of major childhood, the parents have died. What does this tell us? Children's authors know this. They want a success. They just kill the parents right away. What a bestseller. Okay, why? What does this tell us about kids? What does this tell us about play? Okay, a child's greatest need is attachment. A child's greatest need is you. Human babies are born completely vulnerable. They cannot take care of themselves physically. They don't even learn to regulate until a caring adult has regulated them hundreds of times. When they were upset, they've been rocked, they've been soothed, they learn to regulate by being regulated. In fact, a hungry baby will even choose attachment over food. They require, we can't walk, we can't talk, we can't move, we can't do anything. So what happens is children are drawn to stories in which they have their greatest fear seen, but not only does their character survive in the face of their greatest fear, they go on to become magicians, as you said. They go on to take on the world. They have like Superman, they've got capes and they can fly. They can do anything. And there's something so deeply soothing for children about this, that they're drawn to these stories. Now, it's not scary for them because it's not them, it's the character. The character is going through this, not them. That's called one step removed, so it doesn't feel too scary. For some children, they might not be drawn to that. It doesn't happen for every child. And children shouldn't know this, by the way. Play only works to take care of children's psychology because they're unaware of how it's soothing them. They're not aware of it, and therefore, it's like if I said to a child, oh, sweetheart, you know, you're having some attachment problems, I think it'd be a good idea for you to read Anna Green Gables. They'd be like, what kind of weirdo are you? Like, they would have no idea what you're talking about. It doesn't make any sense to them. But it is soothing them in, in, in this deep way. I just got to get a drink of water. So I just want to give you a little tidbit of play, about play before we, we dive into looking at aggression. It's the same with... Um, when, when, when COVID first hit, so I have three kids. When COVID first hit, um, my son, uh, so at our supper table at night, we do what's called high and low every night. So you say the high of your day, you say the low of your day. And my son was in grade six at this time. And my youngest son was in grade six. 
he ran to the table like all excited and great moods. Oh my gosh, we had like such a good day today. We played um, COVID tag. You'd like tag someone and they just throw themselves on the floor and die. Okay, now that doesn't sound so appropriate because people are actually dying, right? Like that doesn't sound so good. But this is how children die, just their anxiety is through play. Black plague, guess what was a, guess what came out of the black plague? Ring around the rosy. I wrote a blog that week called Our Children Are Playing COVID Tag. Should we be worried? My blog was released. All around the world, almost the identical blogs were coming out. All around the world, play had swept in to take care of children's emotion. All around the world, children were playing COVID tag. A similar blog to mine came out in India, in London, UK, in Indonesia, in Thailand. All around the world, kids were all of a sudden playing COVID tag. No one's texting each other. No one's telling each other about it. Children don't go usually to a grown-up and say, I'm feeling alarmed inside. I have a lot of fear. Can we discuss this? No, 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 no. Children go to play as a place to digest their anxiety. They go to play to digest their aggression. If society takes away the place where children digest anxiety and aggression, they just have it instead. And we have, for the most part, removed that from children's lives. The place where nature, we didn't used to have to talk about play. I'm the youngest of nine children. My mom, when I came home from school, maybe some of you had this as well, people who are from a, you know, aren't too young, came home from school, my parents gave me a snack, and then they told me I had to go outside and play, and I wasn't allowed back inside till supper. Anybody else have this sort of experience? You just had to go out and play. This was normal. My mom didn't know anything about play. She didn't know anything about the psychology of play. This was just a cultural norm. The reason we now have to talk about play in relationship is because the culture is no longer taking care of children. When the culture breaks down, all of a sudden teachers and parents are like, uh-oh, <laughs> what is going on? Because our children aren't coping. So now we have to talk about the things that we didn't used to have to talk about when culture was taking care of it for us. So let's look now at, we're going to dive into looking at aggression and how it works with children. And then we'll look at relationship here. So in a culture that it removes connection that children need, their, their biggest need, that removes play, which is their place for digesting emotion, we're going to see more aggression. Now, can you hear me at the back, by the way, a little bit? Yeah? Okay, great. Here, if you imagine this is aggression, okay? Behind every behavior you see, there's an emotion that drives that behavior. If you only try to change the behavior, it doesn't usually last because it won't stick. You've got to get to what's driving that behavior, kind of like with a plant, right? Although humans are a bit more complicated. You can't just like Google us like, like a cactus. What do I do with a cactus versus an orchid? We're messy. We're complicated. We're emotional beings. Anyone that tells you like those books that, you know, one, two, three, magic or magic, I'm like, have you met a child? No. Children aren't rational. We're filled with emotion. We're complicated. So if we look at the emotion that drives aggression, it's frustration. We know that. So every time you see a child that's aggressive, you can say to yourself, oh, my child's frustrated. And just translate it to yourself right away. Now let's look at frustration. Frustration looks like hundreds more than this, but this is this common smattering of what frustration looks like. If the child does not have impulse control yet, it might come out as biting and throwing, or fits and tantrums, or hitting and fighting, or yelling and screaming. As children develop impulse control, Frustra aggression tends to leak out more subtly, like hurtful sarcasm, insults, silent treatment, um, blaming, uh, put downs and shaming. Adult aggression tends to look more like that, but we would still categorize that as aggression. It may even come out as self-attack, either physical or verbal, like I'm so stupid, stupid, or a, ch a child doing that. Often those children have impulse control. They don't want to hurt another child. They don't know where to put their frustration energy that's bursting within their systems, okay? Just so you know, how many, okay, so how many people here have children, um, let's say seven and under? Okay, impulse control, if development has been perfect, no trauma, no developmental trauma, impulse control happens between ages five and seven. Okay, somewhere between roughly ages five and seven, the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain are connected. When the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain are connected, a child can hold on to two opposite feelings at the same time. 
in order to have true impulse control, a child has to be able to hold on to two opposite feelings, kind of like, I want to hit you, but they have an opposite feeling which diffuses it that says something like, but I either love you and I care about you and I don't want to hurt you, or maybe the opposite feeling is, but I don't want to get in trouble. It depends on who the child is and what their opposite feeling is, but they have to have the tug of two opposite feelings, and that doesn't happen until the brain, left brain and right brain are connected. You can have a perfectly well-behaved child before they have impulse control, but before they have impulse control, if they're behaving, it's because of attachment. It's because it feels right to follow your lead. Sort of like a mama duck. You know what I call her all her little ducklings just follow? That's attachment. Before, before a child has impulse control, they're following because it feels right to measure up. They want to do as you ask. They, it feels right with their attachment energy to follow your lead, to follow your cues. But to have actual impulse control where you can hold on to two separate feelings, that can't happen until the left brain and the right brain are connected. Okay, so let's look at this. So again, what's underneath is frustration. So I'm going to walk you through how aggression works with kids. This is going to be, once you understand this, sorry, I've talked all day today. <clears throat> this need some water. Once you understand this, you'll understand it forever. And that's the exciting thing. Because once you get it, you're 